All right, Craig. What's going on, brother? How we doing? What's up, man? Happy Saturday. How we feeling? Feeling good. Uh, try to get this stream to Twitter, but for some reason it's not working. So, sorry, Twitter folks. Uh, sorry, X. Join us on on uh, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube's better anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, fun afternoon here in the old ballpark for the the Red Legs. Yeah, nice little Saturday afternoon. We you you talked about it last night. Not a whole lot of. Uh, saturday midday game so it's nice to have a little 2 p.m start you know I'm, I'm heading to a wedding when we're done here tonight so uh you know worked out for the best for me because i got got a chance to watch the reds game do a little chatterbox reds with nicholas b kirby and then head to a head to a wedding tonight so it's gonna be it's gonna be a great day especially if the reds can uh, go ahead and finish off this this dub yeah what's better than that what's better than that not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Yeah, this will probably be a little bit of a shorter show. I, I say that and it isn't. But, <laughs> Never is. Um, yeah, this will probably be a little shorter one today. Got a, we all got a lot going on, but you know, hey, we're here to be we're here for Chatterbox Reds live post game. Hopefully, uh celebrating back to back wins as Brent Suter just mows down old Gavin Sheets. <laughs> That's tough, man. That guy can't hit a lefty to save his life. Had to face Nick Lodolo today, and then he also actually got a good piece of one and got absolutely robbed by uh, Stuart Fairchild. Yeah, so it's a tough afternoon. Man, what a starting pitching duel today! I mean, you take away that second inning. I mean, Garrett Crochet pitched pretty well. Ten strikeouts and four and two thirds. Yeah, yeah, crochet was uh, he, he was really good outside of uh, that one <laughs> inning. I don't even think necessarily was that terrible in that inning either. Um, and that was one of those innings. If you were one of the eight eight White Sox fans out there, you're like, "Are you kidding me?" You know, that's kind of <laughs> kind of how I probably felt like during that Hunter Green start the other day. Uh, but I think crochet probably even pitched better than Hunter Green did. Seven strikeouts on the curveball. It was he's nasty. Just, he's just so different than like anyone else in this rotation, you know. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really overpower. I mean, he touched ninety five today, which don't get me wrong, is a nice get up on a four seamer. But like, it's not like he's overpowering guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you throw that and you have that curveball, though, it, yeah, it it plays well together. Yeah, I saw a. Uh... <laughs> oh, Nick's, man. For those of you in the chat, Nick's ahead of me. We decided not to sync up today. Nick decided it didn't matter. So <laughs> Nick just I'll, gave you a response let, to something. Let, let me know when you see it. Let me know when you get there. <laughs> the pickoff? Did you see it? I mean, I saw that he got picked off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now five nothing. That was Pilar, five too, nothing, wasn't Nick. it? Yeah. Like that's like their their veteran. <laughs> oh man. Oh poor White Sox I mean, fans. <laughs> no, and don't get no offense to like Brent Suter. It's not like he has a great pickoff move. Like <laughs> what was that pitch? <laughs> 63 mile an hour changeup. Yeah, that was we, a got, we got we got two outs in the ninth. No, no, he's just answering. Oh, Maley was still trying to give a signal, and Suter was out there throwing the ball. Peter Trace is doing the family stuff. Uh, there'll be several times throughout the year that, that me and Trace won't be on. You know, it's 162 games, but we'll do a post game show after every game. Uh, we'll figure out a, a will and a way. I got a baby coming in a couple weeks, so you're gonna miss me. Some of you'll probably be happy about that. <laughs> if you might be sad i don't know we'll see what's but, up nate yeah i can't commit that it's always going to be me and trace but we'll always do a post game show sundays sundays we kind of have executively decided that's going to be at night just works a lot easier uh we didn't get crazy viewership on sundays anyways so it actually seems like more people are able to watch on sunday nights and it makes life a little bit easier for both me and trace so me and Trace both expected to be on 
tomorrow night will probably go live around nine o'clock. All right, let's wrap this up, Suter. Craig's got a wedding to go to. <laughs> if I'm if I'm not off this uh, off this show in an hour and twenty one minutes, I'll start to get a stare down. I'm sure. So I, I think so. I think we can get you out in an hour and twenty. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty confident. <laughs> that ump wants to go home too. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Suter is a young Jamie Moyer. I'm not even sure he's that much younger than Jamie Moyer was at the end. <laughs> How old is Brent Suter? <laughs> I don't think he's that old. Uh, I'm going to, he's, okay. like he's, he's Let, 34. He's 34. Oh, Sorry. I was going to say that. I was going to say that. I was going to play a game and I actually thought 34. I would have won a prize. Oh, El oh, Ellie. Oh, 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 were you worried about his defense? Were people worried about Ellie De La Cruz's defense? Get out of here. Craig, say the words. Let's do a show, Nick. Johnny Bench has tied it up. The Cincinnati Reds win the World Series in four straight. It was a sweep. In the dirt, it's a wild pitch. He has lost the red the game. That ball is fair. Cincinnati's ahead. Two games to go. Welcome, Joe Randa, to Cincinnati. Adam Dunn has done it again. Benzinger backing and calling, and the 1990 World Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. Marty, yes, this is Adam from Milwaukee. Hey, Adam, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? Good. Okay. Do you think Scott Hedenberg is a good player? Done up there with the bases loaded, the outfield deep and around toward right, and the 1-0 on the way to the plate. Swung on, long drive, right field, and this one belongs to the Reds. And a high drive, hit back into deep right field. And De La Cruz is, oh my goodness, look at this kid run. My, oh my, that is a triple. Matt McClain's first big league bomb. Spencer Steer's first big league hit is a home run to straightaway center field. tell you how much it means to play in front of everyone here in Cincinnati as a Red. Uh, what a gift. What a tremendous gift. So thank you. Thank you. I think I can speak for all of Red's country. Joey Votto, thank you.
All right, what's going on? Welcome into Chatterbox Reds live post game show. Nick Kirby here with Craig Sandlin on a five nothing win for your Cincinnati Reds on Saturday afternoon in the return of Nick Lodolo. Craig, how are we feeling, brother? We're feeling great, man. Nick Lodolo looked amazing. The defense looked improved today. Uh, all around. Happy Saturday. Happy Saturday to the chat. Happy uh, Sunday morning to those listening. Hope you had a great start to your weekend. Uh, you know, Trace normally kicks off these shows after wins with a pop in the top on a beer. I'm on a diet, so I'm not allowed to have the beer right now. So if the water bottle came through, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it gave some sort of enjoyment uh, since I couldn't actually crack open a beer. Uh, but yes, a winning edition of Chatterbox Reds on a Saturday afternoon. Sounds like heaven to me, Nick. Absolutely. Uh, maybe the water bottle doesn't bang just as much as the beer, but hey, it's a Saturday afternoon. Uh, what are we going to do? All right, let's jump right into the uh, box score recap. Uh, today, it was uh, Reds, White Sox, game two of their three-game series. Great pitching matchup today. Uh, White Sox eight, Garrett Crochet up against Nick Lodolo. Nick Lodolo making his first start since May 6, 2023. Uh, Crochet looked great early. He struck out the side, struck out India Steer and Christian Encarnacion Strand on the top of the first. Nick Lodolo came out, nearly matched him, went one, two, three. He struck out two. Reds got it going in the top of the second. Jamer Candelario ripped a leadoff double down the left field line. Stuart Fairchild single to left field. That put runners on the corners. Ellie De La Cruz struck out. Stuart Fairchild stole second base, and then Santiago Espinal walked. Then Luke Mal Maley came to the plate. He singled to left field, putting the Reds up to nothing. Bubba Thompson struck out, but then India walked, and then Spencer Steer had the big hit of the day. He smoked a double, 107 off the bat to left field, cleared the bases, and put the Reds up 5 nothing. And that would be it. There would be no other run scored the rest of the ball game. Um, and it was a good thing. The Reds got to uh, uh, Crochet early because he would not give up a hit, hit the rest of the day. He ended up striking out 10 batters um, over four and two-thirds innings. But Nick Lodolo, he was spectacular. Took a no-hitter into the sixth inning. Uh, he got the help of his defense. Ter Stuart Fairchild made a diving catch. Had an 8% catch probability. Spencer Steer topped that. He made a sliding catch with a 7% catch probability. But an incredible day for Nick Lodolo in his first start in nearly a year. Uh, five and two-thirds innings, just gave up one hit, no runs, only walked one batter and struck out 10. The bullpen was fantastic behind him. Fernando Cruz retired all four batters that he faced. He struck out three. Brett Suter, uh, he walked two batters. They gave up a hit, but he got through two scoreless innings as Suter just continues to give the Reds some really nice length of the uh, in their bullpen. And Reds win 5 nothing. Reds will go for the sweep of the Chicago White Sox tomorrow, but... First, let's tell you about what our deep drive of the day was. Sponsored, as always, by Deep South Commodities. It was Spencer Sears' double. 107 off the bat, went 201 feet. Increased the Reds' probability. Win probability all the way up to 89.7%. And our deep drive of the day, sponsored, as always, by Deep South Commodities. DSC is a leader in renewable commodities for biofuel production. They specialize in used cooking oil collection, aggregation, and sales. Visit www.deepsouthcommodities.com for more information. Thanks, as always, to our friends at DSC. All right, Craig. Well, we'll start with uh, Nick Lodolo. I think that's probably the best place to start. Uh, what would you think about his uh, first start in nearly a year? <laughs> I mean, I thought he looked incredible. First of all, I thought he had control. I know he ended up uh, hitting two batters and walking one. Um but just watching his control throughout the game, it felt like he was able to put the pitches where he wanted to a majority of the time. He was painting corners. Uh, he was dropping pitches in. Um, and I got to be honest, that curveball, especially down and into righties, is nasty. I mentioned it on the broadcast specifically, but you know, I think he leads the league in in uh, curveballs that are swung on that actually end up hitting the batter. He got another one today where swing and a miss on a strikeout that ended up hitting the batter. Uh, final line, like you mentioned, five and two thirds innings, one hit, one, uh, no runs, one walk, two hit by pitches, that 10 strikeouts and 91 pitches. And I thought that was interesting too, Nick coming into it. He threw 65 ish pitches in his last uh, rehab start and, uh, coming in today, wasn't sure exactly what his pitch count was going to be. 
We knew he wasn't going to be able to be super stretched out, but he ended up throwing 91 pitches. I thought that was a really good sign out of him as well. Um, and he got a lot of swings and misses. Uh, I think 40% of the swings ended up on whiffs, um, including nine of them on his, on his curve ball. So, I mean, I think if you can get Lodolo back and he can pitch like this and you've got a top of the rotation with Lodolo Montas and green, that's going to be a really competitive ball team or ball club, uh, for the rest of this year. Yeah. Good, good point about Lodolo coming back out in the sixth. I don't think it had anything to do whatsoever with the fact that he had a no hitter. Obviously he wasn't going to finish the game. Um, but I think that kind of shows where the reds feel about where he's at. Uh, I think if they were kind of like, well, it's, you know, don't break the glass type thing. They wouldn't have sent him back out in the, the sixth inning. So I think that was a, a, a really positive sign. Um, as you mentioned, look, the white Sox stink. They're an atrocious baseball team. But he only gave up two hard hit balls in the day. Love that he only walked one guy. Uh, this was a a tailor made perfect start for Nick Lodolo to make his return, but he couldn't have done any better than he did today. And there's no question whatsoever in my mind that Nick Lodolo is a good pitcher. I I feel pretty confident. Say he's it, great. Nick. I Say feel pretty. It, Nick. I feel pretty confident he's a great pitcher. Um, it just can he stay healthy? So like. Seriously, I tweeted out. I can't say it enough. When you when you lay your head down at night every night, just say a prayer. This young man can stay healthy because if he stays healthy, the ceiling of this team it just goes up so so much higher. He's my number. He's my game one starter. If the playoffs were tomorrow, I'd be starting him in game one. I would even hesitate. I, I he, just any by any, he's by far the Reds' best pitcher right now. I think Hunter Green still has a higher ceiling, but there's no way he's even close to where Nick Lodolo is at. I think Nick Lodolo is better than, than Frankie Montas, too. But it's just a matter of can he stay healthy? Looked good today. We'll just uh, hope and pray that he can continue to stay healthy. Yeah, I mean, if Nick Lodolo can return to 2022 form or stay like he did today, obviously, I think there's no question in my mind that he's your game one starter in a playoff series if you make it that way. Uh, the <laughs> way, way too early conversation is that you're going to have an amazing – uh, competition next spring for who's going to be your opening day starter in 2025 with Lodolo, Montas, and Green all battling for that spot. Obviously, Montas earned it this year. Um, but, I mean, yeah, if you if you can keep Montas and you got those three guys competing for an opening day start next year, I mean, that's that's got to feel good as a, as a program uh, looking forward. I mean, Nick Lodolo in 2022 ended the year uh, with 19 starts, 3.66 ERA and 103 innings pitched. Obviously, last year, not as good numbers, but I think he was injured a majority of it. Uh, certainly wasn't feeling 100%. So if he is 100%, which the Reds seem to think he is, and he is throwing the way he is, I mean, that's a good sign. Now it becomes a question of can he be a 200-inning-a-year guy for you? What is the realistic expectation for Nick Lodolo in this ball club moving forward? Um, Certainly would like to see him get 30, 35 starts if he can stay healthy. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, his injuries have historically been wear and tear injuries, not uh, acute injuries. And so you've got to do everything you can to make sure that his body is prepared to stay healthy. And uh, that'll be the main question with Nick Lodolo, I, most likely for the rest of his career, but certainly for the next year or two is, is will he stay healthy? Yeah. And something that's really easy to gloss over in a game that was 5 nothing. Um, felt like it was decided pretty well early is the job that the bullpen did. And Fernando Cruz, man, this guy looks looks outstanding. Uh, retired all four batters today, struck out three. Uh, he had that one outing where he walked three batters. He still wasn't even that bad. He only gave up one run and somehow limited the damage in that outing. But this guy, since he really figured it out last year after he got sent down and came back up, he's been maybe the Reds' best reliever. Now, I'm not I'm not saying like he needs to be like the the number one go-to guy yet. I don't think he's he's proven it that. But he might be the Reds' overall best reliever right now, and he's just such an incredible weapon for the Reds. And then Brent Suter said it many times. Just love that that he can throw him out there. He can throw 40 pitches like he did today. He can give you that length. Um that was something that was so desperately needed last year that the Reds just didn't get other than when they use starters like Ben Lively um, in, in more bulk rules, but but a lot of the innings that Ben Lively ate were on days where 
they did either a bullpen game or they had a starter that didn't go very deep. But having a guy that that can be a traditional reliever and give you some innings, I think that's really, really important. What do you think about Cruz and Suter today? I thought Cruz looked great. Cruz has looked great all year with like the exception of the one outing that you talked about. On the year now, he's up to six and two-thirds innings pitch. He's only given up one hit in those six and two-thirds innings. We talked about it in the offseason. I actually think that the Reds have the ability, should they decide to, to go with almost a closer by committee situation this year with guys like Cruz and obviously Diaz and even a guy like Suter who can come in and has shown time and time again the ability to get outs. Today he comes in two innings. You know, he's a guy that is super valuable in a bullpen where you can go to him in high pressure situations, but you can also go to him and get some innings uh, out of him if needed as well. Um, you know, he struck out two and two innings today, gave up the one hit, the two walks. But um, I do agree with you that Fernando Cruz, especially over the last six months or of baseball, at least, has really looked like the be best reliever out of this bullpen. Um, and again, I said it during our, our Reds preview show this offseason. I, I would not be surprised at all to see him getting save opportunities this year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Reds defense, it's been uh, the thing that I think is worth the most criticism up to this point, the most valid criticism. Uh, they were outstanding today. Uh, Stuart Fairchild, a guy that I've always believed in defensively, made a great catch. Spencer Steer, a guy that I have not believed in, made an even better <laughs> catch. Uh, Bubba Thompson made a great catch. Ellie De La Cruz had that incredible play that looked like it was a catch. It ended up being a bizarre play um, that that it thought for a second the, the White Sox were scoring a run on. But nonetheless, um, Ellie's looking way more comfortable out there. Uh, I, I, this is not a good defensive team. Let's not overreact to, to one game. But it hasn't just been one game. It has been the last several games. They've looked better overall. Uh, they've at least cleaned up some of the the mental airs, and they have a couple guys making nice plays. That's good to see. Well, and if you're Nick Lodolo and you're getting defensive plays behind you like you got early on with Stuart Fairchild in the fourth, um, and then obviously you got it again from Steer in the sixth, that gives you confidence as a pitcher to be able to continue to throw strikes. So not only is it important for today and with Nick Lodolo and what the defense was able to do behind him, but moving forward, as this team continues to improve, if they can continue to show out the way they have defensively, it's going to give those pitchers a lot more confidence to be able to show, throw the ball in the strike zone and not have to force strikeouts and chases by the offense on the other end. Um, you mentioned it. I mean, really five different plays that uh, stood out defensively. I thought personally that the Fairchild catch was actually better than the steer catch. We can have that debate if you really want to. Uh but that Fairchild full extension diving catch in the fourth was incredible to me. He's obviously shown the ability to be a high-level defensive outfielder, um, and coupling that with the offensive output he's been able to give so far this year is is shown that it's been extremely valuable. Um, and then again, the, the play by Ellie at the end of the game, uh, charging in on that soft ground ball, being able to make that throw, um, some of those – you know, high effort, but somewhat routine uh, plays have kind of caused him some difficulty in the past. And so it was nice to see him make that. I mentioned it to you in uh, in text message over the last couple of days, watching Ellie defensively, it feels like he's made some changes to his approach, specifically his arm angle. Um, obviously not on that last play because he had to rush it and was throwing from, you know, bent over. But uh, he seems to be throwing over the top a lot more over the last couple of games. Um, for those in the chat, I'd encourage you to pay attention to that and see what it looks like because there were some plays early on this year where it looked like he was kind of lackadaisical with his throws. Uh, he was dropping his arm angle you know, down to his his hip seemingly. And, uh, and over the last couple of games, it seems like he's coming up, bringing the ball by his ear and, and firing it over to first base. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that continues uh for Ellie uh and he could be a huge asset defensively as we've seen um his range is insane uh and his arm is insane to go with it so uh if he can control it and and work on the transfer he's he's going to get back to the point where he was in uh the minor leagues where everybody was excited about his defense yeah i i fully believe in in Ellie De La Cruz's ability to play defense uh i think he's learning now on uh, at the major league level some of the things you could get away with in the minor leagues, you can't get away up here. If you if you do a, uh, make a flashy play that that fails in the minors, 
people don't talk about it, right? Uh, you, uh, you do it in the big leagues. Uh, it's all over everywhere. It, it's all over the world. So um, he, he's learning. Uh, he's going to continue to improve and get better. But um, he just seems to be playing with a overabundance of confidence right now. And I think he's a player that, that really, more than a lot of other players, is going to feed off of that confidence. It's going to help elevate him to another level. So just great to see Ellie playing uh, good baseball. One guy that is playing good baseball, Spencer Steer. He's got an OPS just three points shy of 1,200. Another just huge hit. I mean, this is an, a, a guy that I think is one of the, you know, inning per inning, kind of just like Nick Lodolo because he's not a guy that's fully stretched out in Garrett Crochet, Garrett Crochet. He's one of the better pitchers in baseball. Steer to put a really good swing, absolutely crush a ball off him. This is a, a guy in Garrett Crochet. Uh, that only gave up three hard hit balls the whole day. Um, that was a big time swing in this game. Really, just put a lot of distance. Um, and, and you know, when you're going into Chicago, uh, a team that that stinks, but this is a team. This is, I haven't mentioned it yet. This is the first time the Reds have ever won a series in Chicago against the White Sox. Ever, <laughs> never happened before. So, shout out to that. But uh, Spencer Steer, Craig. I mean, this guy. He's just off to a unbelievable start. I don't think he's going to keep it up at this level, but um, the 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 idiots like me who said that they thought he might regress, uh, feeling pretty dumb right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say that anybody's feeling dumb. I don't know that anybody came into it expecting Spencer Steer to be performing the way he has so far this year. Uh, you mentioned it in OPS of 1.197. I mean, not only is he getting on base and being productive, but he's, he's smashing the ball when he does. Uh, his batting average now sitting at, 367 um uh, i'll 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 go ahead and uh, take accountability now i know we're 14 games into the season or whatever uh when we did our reds preview game or uh show the line that we projected for spencer steer was an ops plus of 112 and uh <laughs> you and I, you and i both took the under on that so uh not to not to get ahead of ourselves we still have uh 90 plus percent of the season to go but you know 18 rbis in your first 14 games the most by a red since 1962 he had another three today i mean he is everybody will argue about where he should bat in the lineup but no matter where you put it he's producing he's produced in the two hole he's produced in the four hole he's produced in the seven hole like he's just a guy that just plays ball right and it's a, it's a similar reason that i think trace loves matt mclean where it's just like it doesn't matter where you put him and what do you do like he's just a ball player and he's shown this year that he can take that to the next level um and you know it's it's really nice to have and and i'm a big proponent i know a lot of people in the chat will hate me here i love batting him behind ellie um i think giving ellie protection at the end of the order is really valuable and when you have a guy who's smashing the ball, batting after him, you're bound to go after Ellie and try and get him to get out. And so it's going to lead to Ellie getting better pitches, which is then going to lead to Steer having more opportunities to drive in runs. And um, that one-two punch seems like a good opportunity for the Reds to kind of build around uh, as they build their their lineups each day. <laughs> Spencer Steer goes one for three with a double today. His OPS actually dropped three points, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I think that means you're, you're you're playing pretty well. And uh, yeah, my predictions. I mean, I'm. Uh, I, it's just a, it's a tough scene all around because Steer was the one guy I, I was probably the most bold on saying I think he'd progress a little bit. The other guy was Matt McClain, and like, there's no like, like, what do you do for that? Like, he got hurt. So, uh, right. yeah. Hopefully, Ellie. I was really high on Ellie. So let let's keep it up, Ellie. Uh, you can you can save me at the uh, uh, the end of the year. All right, we got a couple more topics we'll get to, uh, but before we do that, uh, we're going to talk to you about the Game Time app. Reds are going to be back in town next weekend, and uh, you need to head down to the ballpark. This is a fun, exciting team. Uh, you might be able to catch Nick Lodolo pitch in person, uh, and be sure to use the Game Time app for that. Uh, the Game Time app is just uh, uh, the best and easiest way to uh, to to find tickets. Um, they have all in pricing, so you can see exactly how much you're going to pay um, before you go into the checkout. You don't have to click through everything. Uh, I love the seat view, the seat layout. Uh, you can really see every section with the prices uh, and easy to compare. Um, and with our promo code Cincy, if you're a first-time user, you can get $20 off your first purchase. 
That's Cincy, C-I-N-C-Y. So download the Game Time app today. Use that promo code Cincy and get yourself $20 off your first purchase. They have tickets for everything too, FC Cincinnati, all the concerts in town, um, and all that kind of stuff. So be sure to check out the Game Time app. And thanks to Game Time for sponsoring Chatterbox Reds. All right. Uh, last offensive player I wanted to mention, Luke Mayley. Real quick, real quick, Nick, before we get uh... – since we're paying some bills, let's give a shout out to Ricky real quick with his uh, super chat. Let's go Reds like the st the stream for the sweep. Thank you to Ricky as always for joining us and to everybody in the chat. We love you all and appreciate you all tuning in on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. What a pro, Craig. What a pro. Sorry, Ricky. I didn't see that because I think you did it right before the show started. So yeah, shout out to you, Ricky. Appreciate you and appreciate everyone who's, who, uh, who watches our dumb show every day. Uh, we really do appreciate it. All right. Luke Maley, another big hit. Uh, he's just, I've said it so many times. It's, when you do these every day, I feel like I say the same things over and over. I guess it kind of is what it is. Uh, you're probably going to have to expect it at some point. Uh, but Luke Maley, he's just the absolute perfect backup catcher. Like, he's everything you want. Tyler Stevenson's playing well as well. So it's just a really nice compliment. And the one thing I've really liked that I've heard a little bit lately is I've heard several interviews with Tyler Stevenson. And Tyler Stevenson has been giving Luke Maley, a guy that he's competing with for playoff for playing time, he's given him a lot of praise on how he helped him prepare to catch Andrew Abbott. So Maley, I think, is more so than being a solid player that is a good hitter for a catcher, at least a, a okay hitter for a catcher, catches a great game. He also, I think, is really helping out Tyler Stevenson learning on the job as well. Yeah, that was something that we talked about during the off season a lot was, you know, this was an uninformed opinion on my end, obviously, but I felt like the Reds needed to go out and add a veteran catcher, not only for the value of just having a good backup, but for that mentorship that I thought Tyler Stevenson needed, but I also thought that this young rotation was going to benefit from. Instead, they go out and they sign Frankie Montas, who obviously has served as a mentor for the pitching staff. We saw that after his latest start, where he comes out and he's still spending time with the other starting pitchers, talking about what he saw, talking about what happened. Um, and then, obviously, Tyler Stevenson has been giving praise to Luke Maley. And Luke Maley has really provided pretty well in those opportunities that he's had. Today was his fifth start of the year. You know, what a, what a luxury it is for the Reds to get production out of their catcher position this year. Because over the last, you know, couple of years, it certainly has felt like, especially last year, that there was some, you know, difficulty in the catcher position. And it was a position that I think a lot of people thought the Reds would need to address in this offseason. The Reds clearly had confidence in what they had in that room by re-signing Luke Maley. And then obviously Tyler Stevenson has gotten a number of starts this year, I think nine um, and is produced produced in those spots. So, you know, Luke Maley, one for three today with a run and two RBIs. He hit the the ball hard twice. He got robbed of a hit uh, his last time up. You know, I thought he played really well, and I thought he's played pretty well in all of his starts, quite frankly. Um, and so having that mentor for Tyler Stevenson probably is playing into the reason why Tyler Stevenson is having the kind of year that he's having so far as well. Yeah. Yeah. Maley's playing well. Um, Reds are playing well. Be nice to get a sweep tomorrow against the Chicago White Sox. Uh, Craig, any other final thoughts on on this game today before I move into uh, some quick Reds in my LB talk and then look at tomorrow's matchup? No, the I think the main takeaway here is you know the Reds showed the ability to hit Garrett Crochet, who's you know a left-handed, hard-throwing pitcher. Uh, putting five runs on the board, obviously it was all in one inning, but they, you know, scattered some other hits around, um, get some confidence going in. And quite frankly, this series is about doing what you're supposed to do, Nick. And that's pick up some W's against a team. That's not that great. They come out, they get the two wins to start the series, go for the sweep tomorrow. And, uh, let's see if we can't build some momentum. I think I might tweet out every time the White Sox win a series, if the Reds pull off the sweep tomorrow. I don't know yeah, that you'll right. be tweeting a whole lot, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're going to win some. They're going to win some. Every team does. Uh, of course, we have to mention that Ellie De La Cruz extended his on-base streak to 19 games. Might have got picked off, but we'll just ignore that part. But uh, <laughs> shout out to Ellie, 19 in a row. Uh, for a guy that has been wildly inconsistent, I think that's fair to say. He still has a 19-game on-base streak, so 
even his inconsistency is more consistent than maybe a lot of us think. So uh, shout out to Ellie De La Cruz. All right, so some Reds MILB. Uh, only one team has been in action so far. Uh, the Dayton Dragons, they lost 8-5 to Cedar Rapids. Uh, the Lookouts, they play a doubleheader. They've got two chances to finally get their uh, first win of the year. They're 0-5. Uh, Daytona gets underway at 6:35. Uh, Louisville at 7:15. Uh, just quickly looking through the Dragons today. Uh, Sal Stewart, he was two for four. Uh, hit a home run, his first home run of the season. Uh, so good to see that as well. Um, Hector Rodriguez was one for four. Leo Balcazar was one for four. Uh, Cam Collier got the uh, afternoon off. Uh, but as always. On the Chatterbox Reds podcast, uh, I'll recap all the Reds minor league action from today. Um, so you can always check that out. The podcast, as we as we've talked about a little bit, it's a little bit different than the the daily YouTube show. Uh, yes, we'll put in like part of our conversation with me and Craig today, uh, but I'll, I'll put in some of the post game interviews from uh, the Reds locker room. I'll recap the Reds uh, uh, minor league action in a lot more detail, and also just give some more uh, news and notes as well. So as always, be sure to check out the. Chatterbox Reds podcast available everywhere you get podcasts. All right, Reds going for the sweep tomorrow. Craig, 2.10 p.m. going up against uh, Michael Soroka, uh, Graham Ashcraft on the mound. Uh, Graham Ashcraft, he uh, made his worst start of his career the last time he faced the White Sox. You might remember that one. That was a game the Reds lost a 17-4 to last year. Uh, Ashcraft didn't make it out of the second inning, gave up eight earned runs in that one. Um, it was a, uh, just a tough game. Um, but if you're looking for a positive, Ben Intendi, uh, Andrew Vaughn and Gavin Sheets were the only players that are actively on the White Sox that were actually in that lineup. Uh, I also remember this because this was the very first game I saw in spring training. Uh, Graham Ashcraft faced the White Sox this spring uh, and actually got rocked as well. So hopefully uh, Ashcraft can get some of that bad White Sox voodoo uh, out of the way. Uh, ben Intendi's one for two against him in his career. Uh, Paul DeYoung, one for two. Robbie Grossman, 0 oh for three. Andrew Vaughn, one for two with a double. But uh, Michael Soroka, this was a guy that was a former first-round pick with the Braves, really burst on the scene back in 2019 when he was an all-star, finished sixth in Cy Young, and was second in Rookie of the Year. Uh, he tore his uh, Achilles, and it kept him out of baseball the entire 2021 season, only made a handful of minor league games in 2022. He was acquired from the Braves, uh, this offseason, part of a big trade that several of the players you see on the White Sox came from. He had a great spring for the White Sox. Um, 1.38 ERA in 13 innings. Struck out 17. Only walked five. So only made one career start against the Reds. Came back in 2019. Uh, one run over five and two-thirds innings. And only two Reds have ever saw Soroka. Candelario is one for two. And Luke Maley is one for two with, a, with two RBIs against him. Uh, before I get your thoughts on this, Craig, I uh, want to mention... Uh, Elijah Evans, who we talked to uh, before the series, uh, when we were talking about the the pitchers, he said Friday night. Um, I'm losing losing the guy's name, Flexen. He said he did not feel good about Flexen. Felt like Flexen's ERA was was legit. It was earned. He said Mike Soroka. He felt like was uh, had had a lot more tough luck. He felt a lot better about him and his potential to be a decent starter this year. Uh, but it'd be, hey, look, it'd be really great to see the Reds come out and get a sweep tomorrow, Craig. Yeah, it would be. And Michael Soroka is the kind of pitcher that the Reds have struggled with in the past. He's not up there throwing heat. Uh, he's throwing a lot of junk. Every single pitch that he throws is below league average in terms of velocity. He's going to be throwing probably, you know, 80% junk, right? So sinker, slider, change up, um, and they're all going to be kind of lower end. He is really a big ground ball uh, pitcher as well, which uh, has not necessarily been something that the Reds have been successful with. Um, so it's an opportunity, yes, for a W, but uh, it'll be interesting to see with Michael Soroka. I mean, I, I do agree that he's probably better than a 6.14 ERA. He's not going to strike out a whole lot of guys, uh, but he is going to get a lot of ground balls, and it'll be interesting to see if those ground balls find holes or if they find mitts. Yeah, and you'll see a completely different lineup than for the Reds. Uh, Will Benson will be in the lineup. Uh, Jake Fraley will be in the lineup. I'd expect Nick Martini in the lineup. So uh, much different lineup than uh, the left-handed lineup they ran out today, but Look, a great opportunity, and this is a, a big start for Graham Ashcraft. You know, I think Graham Ashcraft's spot is safe in the rotation right now. 
But I don't think he's as safe as like if he makes four or five bad starts in a row, the Reds would there would be some rumblings about you know with a guy like Nick Martinez moving back into the rotation. They haven't really said what their plan is with that, but it's a big start for Graham Ashcraft. It'd be nice to see him, uh, you know, get the the demons out against the White Sox, whatever they are. And uh, look, if the Reds get a sweep, it just really you get a sweep in these games. Like you never expect to go into a series and get a sweep. Anyone ever says you need to sweep this team is is completely wrong. Like you never should expect to sweep a team. However, when you have these opportunities, it can make up for later on when you lose a series to the Oakland A's or whoever else throughout the year as baseball happens. So this just kind of gives you a little bit more uh, a flexibility down the line. Yeah, I think I think personally, I I like Graham Ashcraft. I think he's a little bit of a bulldog, right? Like when he's out there, you know that he's going to compete. And certainly his last time out against the Brewers wasn't his best outing. Um, but he pitched okay against the Phillies earlier in the year. Um, in that outing, six innings, uh, only two earned runs. They were both on home runs uh, to Bryce Harper, if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, the Milwaukee Brewers outing five and two-thirds, nine hits, six runs, five of them had earned. So certainly uh, looking for a rebound outing here out of Graham. Um, but like I said, he's a little bit of a bulldog, so I think he'll uh, – He'll be competitive and he'll be looking to bounce back just like we're looking for him to bounce back. Yeah, and Ashcraft was pretty good the first like four innings against the Brewers. And then Reds had that huge lead and it just uh, fell apart. Hard, yeah. hard to know what happened exactly in that one. But uh, but yeah, overall, been really good outside of that last inning when the Reds had the big lead. So hopefully he can get it done tomorrow. I did get one super chat. Shout out to you, Chase. Appreciate you. I know you always are listening and supporting Chatterbox Reds. Appreciate you, Chase. Any idea on when Louder starts next Friday is, is what he thought. I think that's right, Chase. I believe the Dragons uh, do a six-man rotation. Um, again, though, you have to be really careful with the, these minor leagues. Uh, the Dragons are one of the better teams on announcing their starters ahead of time. If you're ever trying to find out when a, a guy in Chattanooga starts, they announce their starters, I think, about 15 minutes before the game starts, and I'm not even joking. It's it's insane. though. I would say Friday, but I would I would you know plan because these games have rainouts. Um, the minor league teams as well that they're they're not gonna uh, sit through long rainouts, so they'll they'll just announce a, a game is is canceled five hours before it starts if they think it's it's not likely. They're not gonna you know go through all the the motions like you do in, in the majors. So, uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Dayton will be at home uh, for a six game series Tuesday through Sunday. Uh, uh, hosting Fort Wayne. I believe that's the uh, Padres affiliate. Um, so yeah, I would definitely, if you're if you're in the Cincinnati or Dayton area, i definitely head up for one of those games. Rhett Ladder would be the great one. I, I think that'll be Friday, but I'd, uh, I'd keep your options open for Thursday and Saturday as well in case, uh, maybe even Sunday in case something changes. But shout out yeah, to you. The, uh, uh, Rhett Lauder's first two starts came on April 5th and April 12th. Uh, both on Friday, so I would imagine that he's probably slotted in on the 19th, but Red Lauder is also one of those guys that I would expect the Reds to want to pitch regardless of what happens, so if there's any threat of weather or anything else, there's obviously that chance that that could get f get flexed, but Red Lauder's looked really good in his first two outings. I don't know. Uh, I know we don't want to talk too much about that today, but I mean, nine innings, six hits, uh, one run so far in his short Reds career, so... If you do have a chance to get out and see him in Dayton, would certainly encourage you to do it because he probably won't be there for too long. He probably has three series, and I'm not I'm not joking because um, in, in the month of May, the uh, Dragons actually their last two and they play six game series are actually on the road. So legitimately, three series left. Um, I think by June he's probably moved up unless you know something goes wrong. So if you want to see Rhett Louder. Get out there now. And that whole team is really fun to watch. Um, they come up to uh, my area uh, here in a couple of weeks. So I'm hoping to get out to uh, at least a game or two as well. And uh, hopefully I can swing the night that Rhett Louder pitches. Craig, I'll be having you uh, fill in for me on Chatterbox Reds. Because honestly, I think Rhett Louder is more important. So no offense. Wow. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No offense, chat. Dang, you, you, want, you want my first hand experience of Rhett Louder on the podcast the next day, right, folks? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts, Craig? 
Let's get a sweep tomorrow. Let's do it. All right, Craig, go get ready for your wedding. Thanks to everyone for listening today. Uh, of course, be sure to check out the Chatterbox Reds podcast, available everywhere you get podcasts. Uh, again, tomorrow we'll be live about 9 p.m. I think that's most Sundays we're going to do night shows uh, going forward. So uh, 9 p.m. Then every other day we'll, we'll try to be live right after the game ends um, unless, you know, life gets in the way. But for Craig, I'm Nick. Have a fantastic Saturday. We'll talk again soon. Go Reds. <laughs>